I also have something I would like to send around, a little survey before we begin. Uh, there's two columns, and yes? Sorry, I have one more thing. Um, the way the directory downloads from our, uh, our database, Church 360, for whatever reason, it goes down the columns, so it'll confuse you at first, but you'll get used to it. It doesn't read across, so alphabetically, left, right, uh, center, and right columns. So just to let you know, if you're not there, look down, look down because it's, it's a little, but it would have taken a lot more time to re restructure that. All right, thank you. Okay, survey. Two columns. It's not a scientific survey, but at least uh, well, at least give me a good idea of where this this group might be at. I uh, I have taught a lot about family life issues See, even before I was called here. I was just a professor at the seminary, and uh, one of the first things I taught here was parenting. We had many 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 weeks on that, so that goes back six to seven years already. So I, I've used this uh, time to teach on family life issues, which includes marriage and parenting and all kinds of issues involved with that. I would like to know if this is the best place to do that. So my question is to you, and all you have to do is put a tick mark. Don't write your name, unless you want to, on the left side or the right side, and I ask this question. I would prefer to learn about family life parenting, marriage, etc., during Sunday mornings at this time or another time during the week. And I'd like to just get a survey and, and see where you're at on that. And uh, if you want to talk to me about it later or you have some questions, that's fine. But sometimes I'll teach on parenting and, and maybe all of you, some of you aren't interested in that. Maybe, even though you're all, maybe most are parents or grandparents. Uh, I might teach on marriage, and you may not be so interested in that on a Sunday morning. I don't know. So I'm going to see where this comes out today, and so I'll pass it around, and uh, if you have any more questions or comments, you can talk to me privately. I'll start with Scott. Just, and everybody just put a tick mark, okay? Just put a tick mark. By people. So husband and wives might disagree. You might disagree. Okay, so just send it around. I mean, what, what do we have, 60, 70 people today? So I, I would like everyone to take more. And then I'll, I'll report this back to our committee meeting, which goes on later, later this morning for that. So, okay. So because of that, I, I thought, well, should I start another, uh, another issue? You know, Pastor Geyer and I have four weeks. And so Pastor Geyer has been teaching Revelation. And of course, that's a big book. There's lots to be said, and then we lose kind of continuity as we teach four weeks on, four weeks off. And so, uh, would it be better, at least for me, to do a, a four-week study so I begin and I end in four weeks? And so I thought, well, what's what's a book of the Bible that I could teach that complements the book of Revelation and has some similar themes in it that is short has five chapters and could be covered in four sessions. Ta-da! <laughs> the epistle of James would fit that bill perfectly. So my goal is, is to start and be finished in four weeks, just a chunk of time, and then we roll on from there. So there's also a question about continuity, just kind of breaking up, and the elders have kind of discussed this too, is what's better? One pastor teach for three months and another pastor take over for three months. Uh, to have two separate Sunday morning Bible classes where both pastors are teaching. So we're, we're trying to figure this out. And we need your opinions on this. All right? It's important that we get your opinions on these things. Talk to your elder if you'd like. So uh, I have a fondness for the book of James. And here's the reason why. When I was a young man, a younger man, uh, about 19 years old, I went to this youth gathering in southern Ontario, just outside of Windsor, uh, the southernmost point in Canada called Point Pelee, which 
is a peninsula that goes right into the Lake Ontario. And if you draw a horizontal line, it is the southernmost point of not only Ontario, but Canada. And so many of us from southern Ontario uh, went to this youth gathering, um, those who were confirmed and above, so 14-year-olds uh, to 30-year-olds, and uh, probably 40 of us gathered. And I, I heard that uh, the main presenter at this youth gathering was some professor from the Fort Wayne Seminary, Professor Kurt Marquardt, who I didn't know from Adam, and, uh, but I was told that, well, he'll be very good. <coughs> Professor Kurt Marquardt, and he was teaching the whole three days on the subject of baptism. And I thought, three days on baptism? Wow, there must be a lot to say, so I'm, I'm anxious to hear about what he has to say. And then the night before I left, the coordinator of the entire event called me and said, uh, we would like you to do a uh, half an hour of devotion, and you and four other young men are going to do a chapter out of the book of James. Okay, thanks for the prep. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, I had never, ever done a Bible study before. Ever. And this is the time my age I was thinking about entering the, the, the ministry, but I wasn't quite there yet, and so they kind of knew that. So I, 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 I dumbly said, yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, go ahead, yeah, fine. I know the Bible inside and out, I'll be happy to do it, sure. And then I said, just assign me any chapter. So they chose four other guys, and uh, they gave me James chapter 1. I was leading off with the brilliant Professor Marquardt <laughs> listening in. And so, uh, so I, you know, I, I take my Bible, that's all I got, you know, just the Bible. And uh, I thought, what, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? And so uh, I get there that night and I, I stay up a bit, I spend uh, a couple hours reading over things, making a few notes, and I get up and I'm nervous, of course, very nervous as something you've never done before. So I had half an hour, about 15 minutes, maybe 20 into it, I'm done. You know, they look, you got 10 more minutes. You ever do that, teachers? <laughs> that's why teachers over plan. And that's why when, when pastors do Bible studies, we fill up lots of time at the beginning, so we don't. <laughs> You know how that is, right? He was killing time. <laughs> so I was done, and I had nothing to say, and I said, I'm done. I'm done, let's pray, you know, and, uh, and, and that, that's all I kind of remember, but I remember Professor Marquardt and uh, the, the things that he taught on baptism. So that was my very first exposure to leading a Bible study, and it was on the book of James, chapter one. So I have a very special place uh, in my heart about it. So. I dedicate this Bible study uh, to Professor Marquardt. And I'm going to bring up some quotes from him in a moment. But this is Lent. And uh, some of you, uh, we call uh, uh, giving up things for Lent. Now, we, we, we don't ask you about it, and we, we, we shouldn't tell people about what we're doing. And it, you know, I, I have told a few people what I'm doing. But I, I also considered that I should start jogging during Lent. This would be a good thing is that, yeah, I used to jog a lot, then I got shin splints, and now I do these uh, elliptical things. But yeah, let's take up jogging. And then I came across this verse. <laughs> so the wicked run when no one's chasing them. And I read that, and I said, okay. I'm done, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, that's it. I will not be jogging. That's right. So here's Professor Marquardt. What can one even say? So I, I dedicate this study to him as a, it brings back good memories. And so here's a, here's a couple, few quotes from Professor Marquardt. Uh, uh, the confessions do not hesitate at the equation. The Bible is the Word of God, and they do not take the is with any grain of salt. 
And so when I first met him, here was this uh, tall, angular uh, gentleman with this uh, soothing, uh, kind of a foreign voice. I couldn't figure out where he was from. What, is he from Australia? Is he from England? Uh, there's a mixture in there. And, and so I, I couldn't figure out where he was from. Here's another one. Um, Lutherans, above all, must recognize and exalt in the incarnational and sacramental realism of the biblical narrative in all its historical particularity and of the theological fullness. It is sacrilege to offer the seamless unity of this holy mystery to the profane claws and teeth of the historical critical abomination of desolation. I had him as a professor, and this is how he, this is how he taught. And, uh, I couldn't keep up with my notes, uh, as, as, uh, but what, what a way with words, obviously. And the last one here, the last one. Without an errancy, the scripture alone principle becomes an empty pretense. If the sacred text is subject to error, then it is no longer the standard of truth, but is itself in need of one. It is no longer judge, but defend. So, uh, I have more of these that I saved up over time, but uh, these are the nuggets, some of them that I kept, and so uh, to, uh, to the Marquardt family, uh, uh, we, I dedicate this to you as well, and uh, how you uh, were raised by, by such a godly man, and uh, one who, of course, was theologically sound. I look at our other seminarians, and uh, um, we, we call it the golden age of the seminary in the, eight, the 1980s, and we had all these... Well, we still have fine professors, but uh, you, you have these giants of the faith, and he was one of them. So I just wanted to make that known to you. Okay. So the Epistle of James, uh, four weeks. So I'll, I'll, I've divided it up into four weeks as best I can. We may not get everything done, but we'll, we'll be done in four weeks. Uh, if, if it is your, your Lenten practice to... Uh, not only go to Wednesday church, but to read extra things or to study scriptures in a different way, go ahead. Here's my recommendation. Read through the Epistle of James um, this Lent. Just, just read through it. It's, uh, it. it's one of those epistles. It's a general epistle, epistle, not mentioned as a particularly pastoral epistle. But along with First and Second Peter and Jude, uh, it, it, it's a, what we call a general epistle, just written for the churches, not for a particular pastor. Uh, uh, in the history of the Lutheran church, there's been uh, issues and problems with it out of the mouth of Luther himself. Uh, he called it a straw epistle. Uh, you could take that two ways. Straw was actually a very good thing in some senses that, well, Luther slept on a mattress of straw. Uh, so straw is good in a way. But straw also is, is kind of uh, filled with holes and uh, 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 can fill things, but there, there's a, a bit of emptiness uh, mixed within the straw as the air pockets fill the straw. So we kind of think Luther, uh, after his, his uh, angst with uh, learning about grace by faith without works, and he comes to this epistle of James, and he has a few negative things to say about it. Uh, the, the, Biggest negative thing he said about this is that for it to be an epistle, uh, anything written in scripture by an author needs to mention the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, which this doesn't. In fact, Jesus is only mentioned two times in passing in this epistle. So, so Luther didn't like it for that primary reason. But then, with what we call the canon of Scripture and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you, you have to look at James with, with the whole canon, right? With all 27 books of the New Testament and how it fits in with how the Holy Spirit uh, gave the words uh, to write on, on this particular subject. It's compared to a lot to uh, the book of Proverbs because of its, uh, uh, it, it's kind of wandering around with general... Uh, instructions on various subjects like the book of Proverbs. It was the earliest uh, writing of the New Testament, the book that was written first around uh, AD 45, around the time of Matthew. So there's a lot of similarities that you can detect from Matthew and James. Uh, the, the chances are that they, they spoke to each other or they read each other's work is very probable. Uh, and, and then the uh, uh, 
written, written by who? James. And so it's commonly known that this is what we call the, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus, or the uterine brother of our Lord Jesus, that he came from Mary's womb, as Jesus did, but his father is Joseph. And so, uh, is it Mark, Matthew, oh, Matthew 13, I think it is, where it talks about Jesus' family, that he had brothers, and uh, I always miss the fourth one. There's uh, Joseph, there's James, there's Jude, Jude who wrote the other epistle right after James, that follows James. So Jude is also a half-brother or uterine brother, right? And so this, this is the James that grew up with Jesus, and as you read through the epistle, it sounds in many parts a lot like the Sermon on the Mount. And, and a lot like things Jesus would say. Well, obviously when you grow up with somebody, you, you do tend to speak and talk like them. So there's evidence of that in, in the epistles itself, right? And so James, uh, as, as scripture says, did not did not believe that Jesus was the, the, the appointed Messiah. They, they thought, even his family thought he was crazy, except for Mary, right? And then until after the resurrection, and those of you who are studying the book of Acts with Drusha, uh, and Drusha, yes, some of you, that, that I, I will need your help because a lot of this parallels with the book of Acts and, and why this was written, right? So you, you who are studying the book of Acts, and you're, you're quite along now in, in that study, and uh, you, you, uh, you can help lend a hand as we talk about these similar issues within the church. So James, uh, uh, Pete Peter was the first, we would say, bishop of the church, the leader of the disciples, but then um, uh, James took over, and, and here we have the first uh, instance of James, a leader of the church, who was also considered an apostle, even though he doesn't self-designate that like Paul. But they, they had to be around when Jesus saw Jesus risen, and he was around during his ministry, and he was around at the ascension as well. So we can deem him as an apostle. And so now, for the first time, he is not a missionary. He is what we call a pastor or the leader of other pastors and congregations. A bishop would be a, a, another proper word. And so he becomes the bishop of the church in Jerusalem and he stays there for over 25 years and doesn't go out. So he, we call it the mother church. Of course, we know what a mother church is like. St. Paul's downtown was and still is considered the mother church of the Fort Wayne area. And they, they uh, spawned what we call daughter churches, right? Zion would be a daughter church, and Emmanuel would be a daughter church, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't know if Ascension was the daughter of a particular church. Uh, district mission. It, it was a district mission, okay. And, and, and in one of the formation of Ascension is that uh, it was the hope that we would uh, spawn a, a daughter church ourselves. It was one of the four four important um, uh, things that we that this church wanted to do. And so I think we, we fulfilled three of them, and this is the one that we haven't got there yet, to, to, to daughter a church, to grow to a size where we can support another church and plant a church. So, so that, that still might be uh, the plan of God here. Anyway, so here's James, and uh, he becomes the, the, the leader of the Jerusalem church. And, and now because of Acts 8, specifically because of the persecution of St. Paul, and uh, the, the, uh, the faithful Christians are now dispersed. They're, they're running away from this persecution that is brought upon them by Paul and others. And so the, the word for this is called a diaspora, a dispersion of God's people, which has a, a purpose in it. And we'll get into this in a moment, but um, they, 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 they disperse all over. The dispassera is, is like a dispersion all over, mostly uh, to Judea and Syria and the northern countries. And then what do they do? Well, they, they form these little congregations. And who, who is overseeing these little congregations but pastors? And 
It's kind of like on-the-job training for these pastors. And so it's, it's James who sends out this general epistle to these congregations now scattered throughout uh, uh, the, the Holy Land and to uh, instruct them and encourage them. And, and again, at the end of the epistle, we read that again, we are reminded of uh, the return of Christ as he ends on that note. So um, he wrote a letter and they were copied and sent out uh, for these pastors to read to their people all over the land as they are dispersed and they're running away from persecution. And we'll get into that, why they're running away. Okay, so uh, here's this faithful man, this, this James uh, uh, that we have. How's the survey going? Is it getting around? Survey's getting around? Okay. I have a question. Yes. What, what year did these disciples get all the stuff together and put into the book Bible? Oh, the, the Bible that we have, the 27 or the 66 books of the whole Bible. All right. Um, Do you, you mean put together as scrolls or put together in a book form? First the scrolls and then the book form. Yeah, the scrolls were available by the second century. Uh, book form Germany. came came much later. Came much later. I don't have the exact dates. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Yeah, but good question. Um, J James, next to Hebrews, has, we say, the most excellent Greek. And so our seminarians, uh, once they get through some of the more simplistic Greek of, uh, uh, say, uh, a Matthew, then hopefully by fourth year seminary, they're studying Hebrews or James because it, it's a bit more difficult, but it's more pure in its, in its uh, um, categories of, of, uh, of language. So it's, it's a very pure Greek. So James became a, obviously a well-educated well man as he wrote this. But it, it's kind of, uh, kind of like Proverbs, it's kind of like splattered over here. We have uh, uh, these five chapters, probably 12, 12 different subjects that are spoken of, even, and even within each subject uh, are different things to talk about. So I, I'm gonna hit the highlights, I won't hit everything, because we just have four weeks. I won't hit everything, uh, we'll read through it, and, and here's how I summarize each part. So the first part is, uh, James writes to struggling Christians who are facing many trials and temptations. Those who face such challenges may be tossed about and eventually destroyed by sin. But those who seek God's wisdom in your trials and become stronger. James encourages Christians to return to the word, take comfort in the gospel, and live righteous lives focused on service to others. So James was interested in the Christian's not only hearing, but doing the word. And there's much to be said about that. We'll hopefully cover that today. And, and briefly, I'll just read these and then we'll, we'll get on with it here. James rebukes an act that is inconsistent with the righteous way, judging others based on their appearance, wealth, or status. He also discusses a false understanding of faith, mere knowledge that has no application or effect on the one who has it. True faith and its response of true good works cannot be separated. Works naturally fall of faith. So that'll be next week. Oops. And then here's the other section I thought we'd tackle together. There are only two ways to live, by the wisdom of the world or by God's wisdom. James condemns the worldly pattern of selfishness, deception, hurtful words, and other evil behaviors using the language of the prophets. He teaches that rejecting God's ways is spiritual adultery. Planning can be good stewardship, but not our plans proud of the things God has us do. James reminds us to seek what the Lord wills. He condemns the wealthy for living as if his life is all there is to live for, and as if Christ did not return. God's word repeatedly warns against this attitude. And then, the, the last Sunday, uh, the return of Jesus in glory shapes the Christian life. James calls sinners to repentance and he exhorts the entire congregation to do the same. Okay. So you do have your outline. Uh, 
So, to two sections uh, today. This is how we can divide the first chapter. Is dealing with trials and temptations, and then on the other side, um, James together. Start off with chapter one, and you'll find a. So he identifies himself. James, we say, the half brother of our Lord, even though he does not self-identify that way. We know he is the leader of the Jerusalem church at this time, and uh, he writes this letter. A servant, a doulos of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. So he just got done recently in Revelation talking about the 12 tribes and the 144,000, right? So why would he address this to the 12 tribes? Aren't these, aren't these Christians he's writing to? Why is he writing to the 12 tribes? These are a, a Jewish designation. What, what's going on here? The 12 tribes. Basically, basically, at that time, I guess just about all Christians were Jews. Okay? Yeah. So if, if you talk to the 12 tribes, you're basically talking to yeah. everybody that's right. Christian. Yeah. They're all Jewish Christians, or Jews have been, who have been converted to Christianity. Basically, that's about all there right. were at that point when he wrote that. But he doesn't discount their relationship to Judaism, does he? As he refers to these 12 tribes, that it's, it's one continuum. It, it's, it's one faith that has continued from the Old Testament down to the, the New Testament and the calling of the gospel and the coming Messiah. So uh, your spiritual ancestry is Jewish. You are part Jewish. Uh, not culturally or nationally, but spiritually. We all call Abraham our father because he is our spiritual father. That's why we come to the term Judeo-Christian. Judeo-Christian, right? Yeah. Also, this was this was written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Right. And the Holy Spirit obviously knew what was coming and going to be written in Revelation anyway. Right. So he very well could have coordinated this to point forward to right. what John would write later. <laughs> right. So we're no different than the actual people from Israel. Well, we are different in what way? In what way? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, right? What's the okay. Messianic Jew? The passport so you Christian mean Jew. all believers who scattered, I mean all believers on a one Catholic, one holy Catholic church. Right. That, that would be me. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you, you see that, and, and uh, you know, the diaspora uh, is a good thing as God scatters his people to do what? To infiltrate the parts of the world with the gospel message of Christ. So even though they're running away for a bad reason, persecution, they're also running away because God sends people to where they should go in, in, in distress so that the gospel can be reached out into Judea, Samaria, and all the parts of the world. But we also realize this, is that, uh, um, yeah, there's one church. There's always been one church on earth, but now denominationalism also begins at this time and, and the people who are studying the book of Acts know what I'm talking about. And this is why James had to write a letter like this and Paul and others uh, because of the false doctrine that, that creeps in. So Peter Scatter and, and, and pastors hopefully are leading churches and preaching the true doctrine. But what was the controversy? I think it's Acts 15. That one party developed that had to be addressed by Peter and Paul. We call it denominationalism because... Uh, Faithful Christians who supposedly study the same word of God now get their own ideas about things, and they start to branch off and then break off from each other. And so we got to nip that thing in the bud right away. What was it? What was the problem at this time, even as James is writing this letter, Drusha? Yeah, um, there are people who came and said they're called Judaizers. Yes. They said that you had to enter into Christianity and life of Christ. 
by becoming Jewish first. So you had to be circumcised and yeah. follow the law of Moses, and then you could become Christian. Yeah. And at this point, um, Paul and the uh, Holy Spirit in Antioch had the Gentiles made a substantial part of the church. And so um, this teaching kind of said, you're not saved if you haven't been circumcised and followed the Sure, church. sure. So that had to be addressed. Otherwise, if it wasn't, then, um, you know, they, they would branch off and become, we call them denominations. It's not really the best word. We, I like the word confession. What is your confession? Not denomination. But because you say denomination, then they're all acceptable. You're just a different branch of Christianity. That was never God's intention. We are all to confess the same things. And that's why the Book of Concord is the best expression of the Christian faith. Absolutely. And we're learning more about that. Uh, on Saturday mornings from Dr. Mays, right? So, uh, so but never, but that's, that's why we need teachers, faithful teachers in the church to do this. Uh, What's the best book yeah. for devotions? The Bible. <laughs> and choose, choose the one you like. Can't beat the Bible. So you know what we're presenting? We're presenting now uh, uh, for Family Life Ministry, the three books that everybody needs to study and know well through the rest of their life. So we started off with the Catechism, and now today is the Bible. What's going to be next next month? The hymnal, my first hymnal. So we start off with the three foundational books that every Christian must use and reuse the rest of their life. So those are the three books. And I've emphasized this in, in parenting classes so much. Um, yeah, so next the Sunday will be April 1st, right? Easter is uh, March 31st this year, early, a bit early, a couple, three weeks early. So uh, April 1st will be that Sunday. Um, this text from Corinthians today should have been reserved for April 1st. The fool, the fools, right? The fools say in their heart there is no God. They, they do have, the atheists do have their day on the calendar. It's called April Fool's Day. So... So, there are uh, scriptures coming up. If, if you wouldn't mind some of you just turning ahead to those, so when we come to them, we save a bit of time. Uh, so, so look, look down the paper. If you see a scripture verse you'd like to look ahead, and keep a marker in it uh, for that. That would be great. So, here are these Christians. Um, um, they're all spread out in the diaspora. This was initiated by Paul and his gang in Acts chapter 8, uh, after the, uh, of course, the martyrdom of Stephen, and, uh, and we say later the great conversion of Paul, later for what he is doing, uh, Acts 11. But then, they are experienced trials and troubles. So here's a Pastor James trying to comfort and encourage those who have run away. And think about this. The question is, what trials and troubles were they experiencing? So it says in verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it all joy when you face trials in your life. Really? Hmm. You know, I got a flat tire the other day, and out the other day, and I just praise God and thank God for this flat tire. And it was a happy day for me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? Count it all joy. All right, I'm, I'm working on it, God. I, I get this, but not always. So think of this: when when you have to pick up and leave and go to a different part of the world that you don't always know what's there, what, what are you giving up? What, just imagine the trials they're experiencing. They have given up. They have given up their home. They're giving up, yes, social relationships and the relationship with others whom they have known. They probably can't all go to the same place, right? And, and they, they find comfort in each other. One reason I think that we like this Bible study with everybody is that we're all together. And, and, and to split it up might be hard for people. 
I, I don't know which one I'll vote to. I don't want to miss my friends. Blah, blah, blah. So I, I get that. Being together is a great encouragement to each other. We get that. What else did they give up? Their? Church. The main church. Okay. Yep. They gave up a different culture. They gave up their businesses. They gave up their work and vocations to earn money. Wow. Right? They lost their large, supportive community. Uh, and how were some of them treated? They were caught. Some of them suffered prison. They went to prison. Some of them experienced flogging. And some even experienced death. Now, did you realize this, that back in this day, back in this age, we call it the age of the martyrs, it began with Stephen, is that people in that age actually look forward to being a martyr, to do it for Christ, because of Christ, to die for him. This was not such a big deal for them as it might be for us. And that was Martin Luther's only one regret in life, that he was not martyred for his faith. And he wrote that and regretted that's the one thing in his life. So there's an age in time these people did not shy away from martyrdom. In fact, I could say that it says, look, joy, count it all joy, my brothers, when you are martyred for Christ's sake. What did Stephen look like? What did Stephen say when he was born? <coughs> yes. Yes. Have we become wimpified as the modern Christian church living in modern day America? Have we become wimpified? I think so. Yep. But look at them. People over in Africa. Now, Africa is an interesting place because uh, it is now considered the center of Christianity in the world. It has grown so much, especially confessional Lutheranism has grown by leaps and bounds. We're thankful for that. But, have you ever heard about the camel's nose? Ever hear about that? What, a seminarian should be familiar with this. Professor Marquardt would speak of the camel's nose. Marsha's shaking her head. Do you want to tell us, Marsha, what the camel's nose is? We'll put you on the spot. Well, if you let the camel's nose get in the tent, everything else comes along with it. Yes. So even the smallest um, untruth brings all the baggage um, yeah. of things along. Yeah. You can't just take the nose, it comes with the body. So you're in a tent. And all of a sudden, this big object shoves right, right through it against this camel's nose. And the camel naturally wants to go all the way in. The tail will soon follow, whereas the camel is overcrowding your tent. This represents false teaching. Let a little bit in, and the rest will follow. So the issue now is that, yes, thanks be to God, Christianity has spread to Africa. But the question now becomes, how soon will it take before they become westernized with our culture? Already there's, uh, uh, I, I've heard of things where they're, they're accepting same-sex attraction, same-sex behavior. And so here's the camel's nose in the westernized culture, whereas they reject it. Uh, people, people are losing, leaving some of these countries and coming to America because they won't be persecuted. Uh, there are people coming from Russia who are homosexuals and they're coming to the southern border because they will be accepted here. But Russia doesn't, you are, you are put in jail if you're a homosexual. So they're leaving Russia and coming here. So when will that camel's nose enter into these African countries that will be westernized and the culture will slowly destroy them as well? as it has destroyed our church here in this country, right? The government permits it. The government permits it, right? All right. So, uh, Acts 22, and uh, it mentions prison, and so we'll just skip over that. Uh, 
prison. They, they were put into prison, some of them, for their faith. Uh, verse 3, what is perseverance? So verse 3 again says uh, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or perseverance. This was a topic in the Revelation study as well. This is why that, uh, it parallels with that study. Uh, how would you define that word perseverance there? Just write your own words, use some of your own words there, freedom. The old German stubbornness and bullheadedness. Okay, well, isn't that interesting? You know, when, when we uh, uh, in, in, induct or commission people, it always ends with, uh, and remain steadfast and immovable. And the first thing I think of is a stubborn German. <laughs> and that's not what it means. Remain stubborn, uh, you know, dig in your heels, you know, just, just, if anybody opposes you, you oppose them. It's like a voter's meeting. You know, no, it's not. How about bravely patient? Okay, bravely patient. Uh, steadfast. Uh, stand up under the pressure. Perseverance. Do it with God's strength, not your strength. And the tests will come. Stand up to these tests. Do it with God's strength. He will do it. Right? Is it also that uh, no matter what is thrown at you, God lets you be able to withstand it because you know, sent what adversary that you can handle will not send to you any more than what you can handle. I think that's what you're thinking of, Patty. Right. Uh, actually, he will, but what the meaning of that is, is that he will send you more than you can handle, which will make you rely on God's strength and give up your own. I've been trying to do this on my own for so long, and finally, I better give it to God. <laughs> He's the one that can do it. I've tried so much and so long and so hard. I'm exhausted. Uh, I forgot God. So he will give you things more than you can handle for that good reason, to rely upon him. So next one, how does the testing of trouble and hardships uh, produce it? Are we given these hardships so that we will fail? No, God doesn't want us to fail, but so that we will ever more rely upon and trust in his power, in his love. That's why we count it all joy. When trials and temptations come our way, count it joy, brothers, because now <coughs> Jesus can demonstrate his love and his power in your life through these things. Oh, and how we have to remind ourselves of this and how James is reminding these people who are dispersed of these things and how they need to be reminded of these things. Uh, the next question is, is not what are, but what or who is the wisdom referred to in verses 5 to 8. And so I read that here. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubt, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The question is, what or who is the wisdom of God? Another word for wisdom could be not, not necessarily knowledge. Knowledge and wisdom are different things. But what wisdom is in Scripture is an understanding, an understanding of God. That is, when things come into your life, the wisdom part of it, the understanding part of it, helps you know and realize that what has come is from God. God has allowed this to happen in my life for a good reason and purpose. That's wisdom. To acknowledge God in everything, in all your ways. And then the wisdom comes that explains to us what God has done about them 
what God is doing about them and what God will do about them, as we have seen his track record of love and mercy and grace always, right? So past, present, and future. So that's why uh, Paul, especially, in, in his writings, would always speak to his recipients, remember, remember what God has done. He's the same God, he will do it again. Don't forget what he did. Remember, remember, remember. Okay, how may it help us to deal with our trials? Um, 1 Corinthians 1, 21 to 25. Does anybody have that? For since in the wisdom of God the world, through its wisdom does not know him, God be pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand no act of signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, as well as law to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. The, the epistle lesson for today, I, I preached on this three years ago, if I remember correctly. And, uh, the theology of the cross, it's placed in Lent because of its particular theology of the cross, the foolishness of the cross is the wisdom of God, and the world cannot see it. All right, I'm going to move on. Next, we are told to rejoice in our trials and persecutions because they produce perseverance and can lead to the crown of life in verse 12. <laughs> Elsewhere in Scripture, we are given other reasons for such rejoicing. What are they? And remember the word joy is, is a part of the word rejoicing. Acts 5.41. Let's look at that for a second. Who has that? Acts 5.41. Then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. They were counted worthy for suffering and dishonor for the name. Capital N, the name of Christ. Read the next verse, 42. What does that say? And every day in the temple and from house to house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Okay, despite the persecution, despite all they were experiencing, they did not stop preaching and teaching. Right? What were Paul and Barnabas doing in, in, in Philippi in the jail? What were they doing? Lamenting, lamenting their woeful situation in life. No, they were singing, 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 singing. Right? What an attitude this is. Oh God, please, I pray, give me this attitude. I need it. I need this attitude desperately in my life. Look at the example I've given to us. So we switch gears a little bit. We, we go on to this first chapter. Now a second uh, subcategory is uh, listening and doing. This speaks more of, uh, and that would be... Uh, Verse 19 and following. So I'm skipping over a few things, but this is my goal is to uh, work through this book for four weeks. Know this. Sir, yeah. A question for you, Ron. You had mentioned earlier about God has no, in, and I don't want to paraphrase because I'll screw it up. God has no intention of us failing. You okay with me? Kind of. Yeah. What you said? Yeah. Failing. Um, can you elaborate on that yeah. just a little bit? Well, the, the eternal failing, not, not, you know, how do you describe or define failing in, in a secular, worldly sense? You know, I lost my job, I, uh, the, date, the date I had left me, uh, my marriage broke up. Uh, when we're talking about the eternal sense of that word, failing, we will never fail. We will, we will never lose our faith. That, that kind of sense of failing. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm glad you're listening. Okay, where am I? Listen, okay, right there. Very good. Know this, my beloved brothers. Um, 
Notice the terminology he uses. This is an appalling way of referring to uh, even the scoundrels in the congregation. Uh, you are still my beloved brothers. You are still loved by Christ. Your relationship with your Lord is secure. Uh, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. All right. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So here, James is speaking of the importance of listening, but not just listening, <coughs> listening attentively to the word of God. Does anybody's mind wander during the sermon? No, not here. It never happens. Never happens. Should, should we all say maybe a little prayer before the preacher gets up in the pulpit? What would you say? What would you pray about as the preacher ascends the, the high stairs into the high pulpit? And you say, or, or as you pray when you get into when you get into worship. You know what, as you open your hymnal, just open the first cover. Do you ever see those list of prayers? Get there early and then start to pray those prayers right at the very first part of the hymnal. Praying for the preacher, and but praying that I remain alert, I remain attentive to the Word of God. Because so all of our minds wander. And, uh, And sometimes a study has been done on this, but the, the, the average person um, goes in and out of a sermon. That is, they, they can think of something different for three minutes, and then they come back in. They have been distracted in their mind for approximately, on average, three minutes. That's a long time. And then they kind of, you know, oh, oh yeah, I've got to listen to the pastor. And I missed three minutes of the sermon. Uh, how does that happen? Well, in one case, remember I, I taught, I remember uh, uh, how to listen to a sermon. You remember that Bible study? Remember that, like, how to listen to a sermon? We did that many, many months ago. It was, uh, it is, uh, uh, focus. Some people close their eyes, and some people just intently listen. Some people watch the pastor. Uh, but this happens to all of us. Listen to the Word of God. Lives are changed by listening to the Word of God. And then James goes so far as to say that once you've heard the Word of God, then you must do it. You must act upon it. Again, and probably another issue within Christian congregations. We are can be good listeners, but it, it makes no effect in our life when we go off and we live our lives uh, as it always was. And there's no change. Um, do it. What's the third commandment? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. We should fear it, Lord God, by what? How's it go? Oh. Do not despise hearing or the word, but I'm glad to hear it and learn it or do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do the word. Right. Do the word. Right. Okay, well, guess what? We're going to end. So again, I knew it. I, I, I wasted so much time at the beginning, I knew I would. But I cannot say today, that's all I have. Let's pray. That 10 minutes I lost when I was 19, now I'm having it on here, now I have 10 extra minutes I, I didn't get to, so, so there it goes. All right, so thank you for your attention. Let's work through James. Read it during Lent. It's a small epistle. Uh, read and digest it. Digest these words. Interesting. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for James and for his faithful uh, adherence to your word and gospel. Help us, Lord, over these next few weeks to learn uh, these, these words, these valuable words given to us by the, the pen of the Holy Spirit through James. 
And Lord, help us and lead us through Lent as again we see you more clearly as our suffering Savior, as we pray in your name. Amen. Oh, and where's that survey? Has everybody had a chance to put your tick mark? Okay, anybody not put their tick mark down?